let's start in Ukraine, where you have a lot of moving pieces to talk about tonight. Um, things are getting really bad in Ukraine. NATO and Western countries do not want peace in that country. There are a lot of innocent people in Ukraine, people that won't have nothing to do with war. And, you know, again, you have NATO and Western leaders actively continuing to push, openly talking now about soldiers, boots on the ground. And they've, you know, West, the West has been, of course, caught torpedoing uh, peace talks that Putin and Zelensky were close to finalizing. We'll have more on that part of the story in just a moment. We also have breaking news and reports of chemical weapons being used by Ukrainians against Russian forces in the Donbass. We also have new reports of planned false flag attacks in Ukraine. In fact, Western media are already repeatedly, reportedly, excuse me, showing up in this town where these false flag attacks are set to ha happen. It's amazing. It's like the media got a phone call like Associated Press and the BBC, like, hey, you might want to go to this town because there might be something that's about to happen there and we're going to definitely need you to report on it. Just like you did in other, in, in, in other false flag attacks over the past couple of months. It's amazing. So get your pretend flak jackets and helmets ready. Right. They're literally, we know the hotel where they're staying at. Isn't that amazing? Like they've flown in ahead of this to be there. So that's how this all works. Um, like they're prepped. And then they can immediately run and print these fake stories. And we have hidden videos showing Ukrainian troops tonight admitting that virtually all of their forces have been eliminated. We're going to show you that bombshell video in just a moment. But uh, somehow I don't think you're going to see any of these stories tonight on corporate media. Like if you flip on uh, Lester Holt on NBC, I don't think you're going to see the stories that we're about to cover here on corporate media. So let's start with a story you're definitely not going to see on CNN, which is chemical weapons. This report comes to us from Denis Pushlin, the acting governor of Donetsk, the Donetsk People's Republic, which is now Russia. They voted overwhelmingly to become part of Russia. He's the acting governor in the Donbass. And let's be clear, if this charge was being leveled at Russians, it would be all over the nightly news. Putin using chemical weapons, da 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 da. You would hear it everywhere, but you won't hear this story. Uh, it would be covered wall to wall on television and radio and every major newspaper. Because remember those 46 Ukrainian bioweapons labs that the, that the Biden administration finally admitted to? They were lying about it, told us they didn't exist. And then, oh, by the way, yes, they do exist. So just put a pin in that for a moment. Might come back. So here is the story. Ukraine accused of chemical warfare. Toxic compounds have reportedly been used against Russian troops in Donbass. Russian military commanders have reported that Ukrainian troops are uh, troops deployed a type of chemical weapon against their units in Donbass, according to a local official. Speaking to Russian television on Monday, Denis Pushilin, the acting governor of the Netsk People's Republic, said his office has been receiving reports about possible chemical warfare for at least two weeks. Ukrainian troops have reportedly been deploying chemical compounds that make our military service members ill, he said. Really, now, really quickly, do you mm -hmm. did we cover did we cover or show the videos recently where remember when they had packed refrigerators and they had the chemicals in there? I thought we played a video or something like that on yeah. this channel, but I can't remember if I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they had these chemical things that they were making and putting in the refrigerators to store. Yes. So it checks out. Yes, it does. So when you think back to those 46 bioweapons labs, when they're no, no, they're just bio research facilities, according to Victoria Newland. OK. And who knows? Maybe these came out of there or not. We don't know. We know very little about it. And so, by the way, we should be fair and transparent here. So, by the way, does Dmitry Peskov in the Ministry of Defense for Russia, the spokesperson for the Kremlin this afternoon, declining to discuss any of this with journalists or the press. So Russia is not running out there, at least from the Kremlin point of view. The governor is in Donetsk, but the Kremlin is saying we're not going to talk to journalists about that. Um, that we don't have any accurate information about the issue yet. We don't, so we're not talking about it. But, but if they did, I mean, think about if the shoe were on the other foot, they'd be running around all over the place shouting about it, but they're not. So hat tip to them for just keeping their mouth shut on this. We don't know. But that, that's the report this afternoon. It's from the acting governor that this is what's happening. So Pushkin says, Russian military 
So Peskov says, excuse me, the Russian military would pass such incidents up the chain of command and suggest the combat, the, the con contacting the defense ministry with further inquiries. The defense ministry didn't have any um, immediately uh, comment on the claim. Speculation that some Ukrainian units may use airdropped munitions with a chemical agent has been swirling on social media for the past, cu past couple of weeks since mid, uh, since mid January, actually. The rumors were apparently triggered by a video that surfaced people showing uh, people in Ukrainian military uniforms assembling around a small quad of drones carrying small containers with a payload apparently taken from a refrigerator that we showed here on the show. Some military people are saying that whatever was used must have been volatile if it had to be store at, stored at very low temperatures. So we'll be watching this story and see how it develops. We'll wait till we hear more from the Russian side and the Kremlin on this. And we'll see if there's any response from from chemical uh, from the other side. Of course, chem chemical warfare is illegal. So it'll be interesting to hear what the Western side says about this um, and what Ukraine says about this. We'll see if we can get any answers from them. But that's the report on chemical weapons. Meanwhile, this is a this is a desperate move right now by desperate alliance, which is NATO. And NATO is getting very, very desperate. Now NATO is actively talking about putting boots on the ground in Ukraine. So you might be sitting, have they lost their minds? And the answer is yes, they have lost their minds. NATO members over the, I think they're just too proud right now. Like they've crossed the Rubicon. Are they going to be able to just go back with their tail between their legs once this all unfolds over the next few weeks? I don't think so. I think they're now, they've, they've got too much at stake now. They've put too much out there. Their pride would be hurt. Could you imagine like Secretary Austin, Jen Stoltenberg, all of these guys just being like, all right, we're going home. You showed us. No, they're too proud. Boris Johnson, all these guys, all these clowns, all these warmongers. NATO members over the past few days have started beating the drum that Ukraine is collapsing. So they're saying it. They know what's coming. They know that Ukraine is done. Let's put Western NATO forces on the battlefield now. Let's put boots on the ground. Here is former British defense minister on the urgent need. And see what, they, what they're doing is they love to bring out people who were part of the deep state and they put them out on television. They feed them information. This is how it works. The, 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 the intelligence state feeds them information and then they go on national television and they float these ideas. Same thing with David Petraeus. Same thing with all of these guys. This is how it works. And we know that because we've heard directly from members of the deep state have told us exactly how it works. So here is the former defense minister of, uh, of, of the UK talking about boots on the ground. Watch. I, I do. I feel that certainly if you were to put a NATO force in there, uh, that would be NATO uh, versus Russia. Uh, but Russia is the, is the guilty party here. Russia has invaded an, another sovereign state. And uh, we have declared, everybody in the West has declared that uh, Ukraine has got to win, and we're doing a tremendous amount. Britain led the way under Boris Johnson in leading the, uh, uh, the support for Ukraine. And the West has got to decide um, that if it is going to support Ukraine, and Ukraine does have to win, because if Ukraine does not win, where will Putin go next? We have to decide exactly how we're going to do this. And I think just edging slowly, a bit more here, a bit more there, is not the answer. So you got to go all the way. You got to get forces in there. We got to get those jets and we got to put human beings to fight in these trenches against Putin's army. Smart move. Hey, will you send your son or daughter? In the U.S., former CIA director David Petraeus says that boots on the ground is one option for the next stage of this conflict, but he's also beating the drum for regime change in Russia. Again, handed information from the deep state. Remember, he had a security clearance revoked a number of years ago after he was basically giving secrets to his pillow talk lady. Um, and uh, But nevertheless, over the past couple of months, he's been trotted out by the deep state to go on CNN, to go on MSNBC, to do these television interviews with the Washington Post and others and push regime change in Russia. He admits the CIA, this is amazing, he admits the CIA is already preparing a coup in Russia and he'd like to see that unfold. That's an option for him, a coup in Russia, regime change. Watch. The other alternative, of course, is 
regime change. Uh, and that is so hard to calculate. And it, it, he has such a grip on power. Um, but also, as you know from history, um, what is inconceivable uh, all of a sudden can become inevitable, uh, sometimes overnight. Um, and looking for those kind of indicators is something that an organization near and dear to both our hearts uh, is looking for, I'm sure, very, very assiduous. Yeah, the CIA, an organization near and dear to both of our hearts. Like when I go to bed, you know, when I like curling up in bed and I'm thinking about what's what's near and dear to my heart, the CIA is the first thing I think of. And then I reach over and kiss my wife goodnight. It's like the the um, Jack Nicholson and a few good men. We we're like we want them on that wall. We need them on that wall. You they're want there us to protect us. They wake up every day with people fifty feet away that want to kill them. <laughs> like, do you feel safer? So we, we support. Them. Do you feel no. like? Do you feel safer that we go into Nicaragua and you know so discontent and destabilize the country so much so that millions of Nicaraguans then pour across the border in southern United States? Or do you feel well, no, safer like, that that's, we go into Sudan or, or Syria or Yemen or Somalia or Haiti and, and destabilize those countries so that they want to hurt us? Do you feel safer? Uh, I don't. Yeah, well, I've talked about Anwar al Awlaki, who was over, you know, in those areas trying to tell children, you know, just because, because they say every time an innocent person dies, so 90% plus of people who die in drone strikes are innocent, right? Mm -hmm. So out of those innocent people, their family members want to raise up arms against the U.S. Why wouldn't they? And Anwar al Awlaki was over there saying, look, we can't let the military, you know, make you not like American people because American people are not doing this. But like, think about it for every one of their innocent people that die, you're going to have people that hate the United States and that's growing more and more and more. So why, you know, like we're creating basically what we, what we are, we are the mm -hmm. terrorists, but we're creating more by killing innocent people. Yeah. And then they, of course, you know, yeah, they see their father die and you know, they raise with that hatred in their heart for a country that, you know, we know the stories, but so boots on the ground, regime change. That's what David Petraeus wants. Did I say Petraeus? I meant to say Petraeus. That's my, perfect. Um, my apologies. I must have Freudian slip there. Um, I love this tweet in response to, to Petraeus. Uh, very arrogant and presumptuous for him to come straight out and say it. Coup d'etat is our normal business. Is it why there is a conflict in Ukraine now? Putin is not Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein. This is a different and very dangerous level of game. Yeah. But they don't see it that way. Did you hear what David said, what Petraeus said? He said, sometimes the impossible becomes inevitable, right? The idea that we would actually be going to war with Russia, that seems impossible. But is it, it's inevitable when you provoke them starting in 2014 with sniper attacks to kill people and foment, well, I would uh, argue, you know, a disaster in the Maidan coup, right? I would argue even right after World War II, when we set up bases to basically and started NATO in response to uh, the Soviet Union. So like we've been messing with them since then, like too far, yeah. 2014. Well, yeah. Yes, again, that's where it escalated. But well, and we learned in the 1950s, early 1950s, that Soviet Union wanted to become part of NATO and actually talked and op openly offered. And we said no. So imagine how different things would be because we can't have two powerful leaders, right? That's the thing, right? We need to have a leader. We need to have one leader on the Western side and then we need to have an enemy, right? That's how these things work and good storytelling. And that's exactly what we're doing now. So the impossible becomes inevitable when you, yeah, increase and provoke and get to this level of insanity by sending uh, continuing to send a ton of weapons into this country. So, of course, NATO doesn't want peace at all. Now we have more confirmation of this. This weekend, in fact, we now know that the peace was almost ironed out. This is remarkable. Peace was almost ironed out between Putin and Zelensky until NATO got in the way of it. So this is the former prime minister of Israel. Uh, this is Naftali Bennett. This is his first interview that he's done uh, since leaving office. He sat down on Saturday into this interview and said that NATO blocked his efforts at brokering peace between Ukraine and Russia. So here's how David DeCamp over at antiwar.com puts it in text. And he says, on March 4th, 2022, Bennett traveled to Russia to meet with President Putin. 
In the interview, he details his meditation at the time between uh, uh, mediation, excuse me, between Putin and Ukrainian President Zelensky, which he said he coordinated with the United States, France, Germany, and the UK. Bennett said that both sides agreed to major concessions during his mediation effort. But ultimately, the Western leaders opposed Bennett's efforts. He says, quote, I'll say this in the broad sense. I think there was a legitimate decision by the West to keep striking Putin and not negotiate, Bennett said. When asked if the Western powers blocked the mediation efforts, Bennett said, basically, yes, they blocked it. And I thought they were wrong. Admission from the Israeli prime minister who was in the room where it happened. Caitlin Johnstone takes it one step further and says, she writes, in March of last year, Bloomberg's uh, uh, Niall Ferguson reported that sources in the U.S. and U.K. governments had told him the real goal of Western powers in this conflict is not to negotiate peace or end the war quickly, but to prolong it in order to bleed Putin and achieve regime change in Moscow. Ferguson wrote that he has reached the conclusion that the U.S. intends to keep this war going, and he says he has other sources to corroborate this. And remember in September, Vladimir Putin gave a speech in which he addressed this. He addressed the fact that they were actively in Turkey having peace talks with Zelensky and were getting very close to a conclusion, a peaceful solution, until someone got in the way. Listen. And I want to say that publicly for the first time, after the start of the special military operation, also at the Istanbul negotiations, um, uh, there was a very positive reaction to our proposals concerning ensuring the security of Russia. But it was obvious that the West was not happy with a peaceful decision. So after reaching certain compromises, they effectively were given a direct um, order to undermine the negotiations. Don't you love the West? Don't you love NATO? Like here we literally have them at the table agreeing to a peaceful solution to this. Like we're going to take this portion of the Donbass, the area that you've been attacking for the last eight years, and there's been a genocide there. We'd like you to stop killing innocent people. We're going, to, we're going to provide security and stability in that area. That's part of our, that's what our concession will be. And then we will leave you alone. And we will, we will also make other concessions on our side. There were big concessions made by the Russian side. Sorry, we don't want that. We would rather have death and destruction. We would rather have the West continuing to provoke Russia because we see the decline of the U.S. dollar it's about power, the decline of the U.S. dollar hegemony and power in the West. How do we hang on to power? We have to create regime change in Russia. Russia is becoming too self-sufficient. It's aligning itself too strongly with, with China, Saudi Arabia, and other nations. And it's a, huge, it's a huge point of contention for the West. So another big story this afternoon, as if chemical weapons attacks and boots on the ground weren't enough for you. Sources are reporting that Ukraine and NATO are about to carry out a false flag attack in the city of Kramatorsk. So here's the map of Kramatorsk. And this is stunning report. So this is a stunning bit of breaking news in Ukraine. This report comes to us from War on Fakes, and they're reporting that the Russian Federation's Interdepartmental Humanitarian Response Coordination Headquarters in Ukraine has issued an urgent statement from Russia. According to a number of sources, the Ukrainian security services are preparing to carry out a large-scale provocation in this city in the near future in order to accuse Russia of committing, quote, war crimes. For this purpose, the Kyiv regime plans to use controlled charges to blow up the buildings of the narcological and oncological dispensaries located on the 31st, uh, 31st Alexei Street, as well as the First City Hospital on 17th Alexei Street. This is planned to, in, in order to accuse Russia of allegedly deliberately targeting civilian facilities. The staff of the medical facilities have already been evacuated, and the staff have been shifted to remote work. Imagine finding out like, hey, we'd rather you not come into work today because we're basically going to blow up the building and blame it on Russians. So probably don't want to show up to work today. Okay. 
all right, I'll stay home. I've got some work I can do from home. Just let us know when this is over. I can come back to work again. Uh, but this is my favorite part of the story. <laughs> Journalists from Western media outlets, and I'm sure the Associated Press is right there, have already arrived in the city accompanied by the Security Service of Ukraine, the SBU. And they're staying at the Sapphire Hotel. So we know where they're staying. The bombing of medical facilities in uh, Kramatorsk is planned to be presented in the West as yet another crime committed by Russian troops, demanding a response from the international community and an acceleration in the supply of new weapons in Kyiv. So the reason I love reporting on these false flag attacks is, I mean, even if we sometimes we sometimes we report on them and they end up happening anyway, like, you know, but but at least getting the message out there about it can prevent them. Uh, prevent well, them from happening. And also, happening. De yeah, and debunk them. Because remember when we covered the story, they were trying to convince us that all of these people were killed in this certain area. And then when the cars were driving by, there were dead people getting up after the car drove by. Remember, like hands were moving and right. like they've tried to do this several times. And so by us either covering it after, after the fact debunks it or covering it before the attack stops it from spreading as a false or, or, or showing that it is a false flag. Yeah, that's a great point, right? So it debunks it and we can show you that this is what they do. They actively do this stuff. Um, I mean, look, there's all kinds of propaganda in war. It's been the way it's been for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, right? But this is the worst we've ever seen. And it's unbelievable how complicit the Western media is in this. And you had that one reporter, that reporter standing there. He's like an all of it. And it was like he was like a sea of body bags behind him. And there's one and the body bag wasn't completely over the body. And you see the person under the body bag pull it over himself <laughs> like actors, you know, like this is what. And then this is this is like broadcast on CNN. It's like, here I am with all of these bodies. Never mind that person who's just an actor, just covering himself up with the body bag. That's just normal like, dead I'm people not behavior. Dead yet. Right, I'm not dead yet. It's just normal dead people behavior. <laughs> Bring out your dead. So, I mean, this is amazing. Journalist, I would love to know which journalists are there. Just keep your eye out for some tweets from different journalists, journalists from like the Associated Press, the BBC, you know, the normal players. Well, one thing I can tell you, if it's anybody like, uh, you know, a, a high level journalist, they're not going to put them in harm's way. So if like you're, um, uh, what's the white haired, uh, Anderson Cooper, if it's people like that, that are there, we know they're in no danger. No, of course, but they'll still have on their little, the little army hat, their little army helmet. Yeah. Like we're really, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a press. I'm, I'm in the press here. I am in the comfort of my hotel in thousands of miles away from any kind of battlefront. So remarkable. We'll see what happens with this false flag attack, but again, medical, Facilities have been evacuated and journalists are flying in so they can be right there with their fo their their cameras and their video cameras ready to go. Uh, and this is desperation. I mean, this is what you're seeing, guys. This is desperation because NATO is trying to do whatever it can right now to try to curry favor with, you know, um, with a national television audience with. Oh, my God. Yeah, we, we're so tired of Ukraine. We're tired of all the money we're pouring in there. But did you see what Russia just did to this hospital? All right, we got it. We, you know what? We've got to send boots on the ground. We've just, we've got to send additional tanks. We've got to put an end to Putin. And there's a lot of dumb people out there who will fall for that. Because there's a lot of dumb people out there who just are tuned in to watch MSNBC or CNN or just watch corporate media. And they, they, they don't know any better. They really don't. So again, desperation. Now, here's another piece of desperation. I told you there are a lot of pieces in Ukraine tonight. And I wanted to bring it to you because you're not going to see this in the mainstream media anywhere else. At least I don't think you will. Um, a new video just released of Ukrainian soldiers talking openly um, about the true realities of the war. Uh, friend of the show, Colonel Douglas McGregor, um, sent this to me earlier and said, you've got to see this, Clayton. You've got to see this hidden camera footage. And you can see, and now we've been hearing about these soldiers leaving the battlefield completely. They have no support. Right? They're being openly decimated. They've been cannon fodder. Um, and as Colonel McGregor puts it, it's like a meat grinder. The meat grinder is about to happen here. Because they're just literally throwing people into the meat grinder at this point. And this is video example number one of this meat grinder. So this is soldiers admitting that the casualties are severe. They're in a room talking about how these new guys that are coming have no idea what's about to happen. He said that they're basically saying there's no army left to speak of anymore. 
So someone set up a camera in this room while they're talking and that any of these guys that will are being sent to the front lines will be killed immediately is basically what is being said here. So this is uh, this is Ukrainian. I'm, I'm not going to translate it, but we'll have subtitles here on the screen for you to watch. Take a look. Короче, я вам расскажу, чтобы вы мне не доказывали. Нету больше приходных рот. Нету. Сука, нету. С моей роты седьмой осталось, блядь, 18 человек, нахуй. 18, блядь. So just to sum it up, they're all kibitzing about how bad things are and how awful it is on the front lines. And the people that are coming in literally have no idea what they're about to get into. And at one point he says, he said, there's no one left. He said, our entire company is destroyed. They're all gone. All the infantry is gone. They're just destroyed. There's well, nothing. He's like, he's like a one guy here. He's like, we got one guy here, one guy here left. He's like, it's literally like nothing left. And they have no idea what they're about to experience when they're here. I saw a video this weekend on Twitter of parents arguing with officials that were there trying now to recruit 15, 16, and 17 year olds uh, to go to the front line because they're running out of people. Yeah. And 60 year and 80 year olds. I mean, like whatever you've got left, just throw them into the meat grinder. It's unbelievable. And who's caught in all of it? It's the innocent people of Ukraine who are in this. Who've had their lives upended because of this. And opportunity after opportunity to never let it get to this point. And you can blame NATO. You can blame the West. You can blame Boris Johnson torpedoing pre uh, peace talks. All in an effort to shore up Western strength. So Putin has just so issued... Go ahead. I, I just want to say what really irritates me is that people, you know, you have to have a bad guy and Putin has been made the bad guy, but Putin has made every effort and he's said this over and over again and has shown how patient he has been and he's made every effort to minimize casualties of all, even the military, like he, he's taken prisoners and things rather than killing in, in a lot of cases, but they're continually giving him no choice. But to say that he's done anything, like he has gone out of his way to avoid any casualty as much as possible. And I think that is what elevates him in this situation in my mind because he's trying not to do this but they're putting him in a situation that he has to he has to do what he's doing yeah i don't know i i hear what you're saying and i you know i could sort of i grew up the idea that like nothing ever good comes from war nothing right yeah and so i agree but then you look at but 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 if you have to me it's like if you have the the most warmongerous country in the world which is the united states right, right. we are warmongers we do we love war and if that we would build like if, if you had a, a person who was you know just this military person that hated people and everything and they built their house next to yours and put up a fence with barbed wire and would like aim a gun at your kids when they walked over there because they were too close to their property you would probably do everything you could to get rid of them. And at some point, if they ever hurt your kid or ever made your kid feel like they're in danger, you would attack those, those people. And I look at it kind of like that. It's like he did, that the only thing he did not want was NATO or the United States at his next door yeah. to him. Well, and we promised him that that would be the case, that we wouldn't do that. Right. And we've been uh, promising that since World War II. And so we incrementally get closer to that door. I just come back to the idea like, yeah, that to me... Nothing, nothing ever good comes from war and there should always be a solution that's better. So, you know, I invading a country is not the solution that I would ever, ever want. But, you know, this is the solution that we have. This is the this is the solution that's on the table right now. And at the end of the day, there was a genocide unfolding in in the Donbass for eight years where tens of thousands of people were being killed. Civilians on a regular basis by Ukrainian shelling. And the West did nothing. They created it. They provoked it. They fomented it. And so what was, you know, what was the Russian science supposed to do? Ethnic Russians who were having their families slaughtered. You know, it's like Bill Clinton's greatest regret, other than 
God knows what else, Monica Lewinsky or whatever, but his greatest regret of his presidency, he said, was uh, acting too, too slowly in Rwanda. Right? So when a genocide is unfolding, like waiting, waiting too long. So eight years, how long, how much longer do you want to go? How much more evidence do you need of the slaughter that's continuing there? So last week, I mean, I mean, Putin just issued his most direct threat against this NATO, these NATO weapons and involvement in Ukraine. I'll show you what he said in a moment. But first, last week, NATO made a big push to send a lot more weapons into Ukraine. The U.S. announced billions more, including Javelin missiles, more HIMARS weapons separately. And then Washington pledged to send 31 Abrams tanks. But that doesn't, they're not even expected to be delivered until the end of 2023. At the earliest. Germany also changed its stance on supplying modern armor to Kyiv, pledging to deliver 14 Leopard tanks, as well as allowing European countries to re-export German-made vehicles from their own inventories. And Portugal getting in on the action as well. I'll have more to say about Portugal in just a moment, but the number of Leopard tanks expected to be funneled to Ukraine amounts to some 112 vehicles. And so Putin this weekend at the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Stalingrad, um, I think it was 80th, yeah, he was there at the, and he was, he was talking about Stalingrad, he was talking about, I can't believe we're literally talking about this again. Again, we have German leopard tanks coming to attack us. Like, he's like, didn't we just go, didn't we go through this in a world war before? We really have to go through this again? But in this speech, he issues his sternest and strongest warnings yet to NATO about what will come if they continue to provoke. Watch. Невероятно, но факт. Нам снова угрожают немецкими танками Леопард. На борту которых кресты. И вновь собираются воевать с Россией на земле Украины руками последующей Гитлера, руками бандеровцев. Мы свои танки к их границам не посылаем. Но у нас есть чем ответить. И применением бронетехники дело не закончится. Все должны это понимать. Для тех, кто угрожает нам, видимо, для них непонятно простая истина. Весь наш народ, все мы росли и с молоком матери впитали в себя традиции нашего народа. Поколение победителей, которые своим трудом, потом и кровью создали нашу страну и передали ее нам в наследство. Стойкость защитников Сталинграда для российского воинства, для всех нас важнейший морально-нравственный ориентир. И наши солдаты и офицеры верны. So it won't just be with armor. Like, get ready. So you want to keep doing this, it's going to be a, a wake-up call sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.